know it's made with grace. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started. We're going to start a new unit today. This unit is on deep networks and convolutional networks. So, um, so we're going to start by talking about data sets. So when you look at the data sets that were in use um, before 2009, um, they were relatively small by today's standards. So here are a few examples. So um, MNIST, we've talked about this one, 70,000 examples, 10 classes, 28 by 28 grayscale images. Another uh, data set that is still used widely today, but more as a toy, is known as CIFR-10. Um, this, these are examples from CIFR-10. Here there are 60,000 examples. There are, again, 10 classes. These are color images, 32 by 32. And the classes are these. You can see airplane, automobile, bird, cat, and so on. <clears throat> Another data set that was popular back in that time, Pascal VOC, um, 11,000 examples, 20 classes. The images had variable sizes, but they weren't very large. They were similar sized. Um, so that's what people were working with at the time. And, and in fact, um, because the methodology and the computing hardware at the time were nothing like today, even these data sets would take a while to train on. So um, when, when a, a researcher named Fei-Fei Li, she proposed this idea. It was actually a very strange idea at the time. It was, um, it was a bit surprising. She said to develop better algorithms or methods, we actually need to collect more data, and so this like I said, this was kind of strange at the time because people were already having a hard time handling the, the data sets they had. So her goal, uh, which was very am ambitious, was to map out the entire world of objects. And um, <clears throat> there's a really nice article about, about that. Um, so her idea was to take this existing data set called WordNet. WordNet was um, basically a way of of just splitting up words in the English language hierarchically um, that kind of gave a sense for how many different, you know, very different objects are out there, at least, you know, at a certain level of granularity. And um, <clears throat> so she, she made a data set sort of based on that. Um, and actually, I'm not sure where I got these numbers. I think these numbers were um, maybe in just one subset of the full data set. So the full image net has 14 million images and 21.8 thousand classes. So it's actually much bigger than what I wrote there. Um, so here is an example of the sort of hierarchical um, construction. So like within vehicles, which is you know one class of things, you have types of vehicles which include crafts, types of crafts which include watercrafts. Types of watercrafts include sailing vessels, and those include sailboats, and those include trimarans. So you have really quite a bit of different um, granularity there. And then there's particular subsets of ImageNet that have really high, um, high granularity, like there's um, a subset of 120 different dog species. Um, so, so here's kind of like, the hierarchy of dogs. Anyway, um, so s some of what was really um, the big challenge at the time is although you can find many images on the internet, just you know on Flickr or whatever databases, they're not labeled. They're not labeled with you know the class of what's what's in that image. And so uh, what they did is they used Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which is a platform run by Amazon where you can pay people to do simple tasks online. And so what they did is they, they paid people to uh, basically classify all these images just with, you know, maybe a couple cents per image. Um, and people would label, like, I think they, on average, it would take them, like, two seconds per image or something like that. So that's how they uh, labeled all these images. <clears throat> and 
everything is detailed in this 2009 CVR paper. <clears throat> and once they had that data set, they ran this uh, competition, ILS VRC, Inter ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge. So this is a, a competition that was held yearly from 2010 to 2017. And 2012 is a very special year, um, as we'll see. And in that year, they had several sub-competitions. Um, so one of them was classification among 1,000 classes. And for those 1,000 classes, there was, I think, 1.2 million training images. And so the participants or the, the methods had to list the five most likely classes per image. And then if, if one of those five matched the ground truth label, that was considered correct. <clears throat> Another uh, competition that year was the fine grain classification where there was 120 different dog categories. And another class, uh, competition was <coughs> classification with localization. So um, not only did you have to list the five most likely classes, but you had to draw a bounding box uh, of where in the image that occurred. And what's really challenging about, <coughs> about these competitions and the data set is that when you look at the images from the data set, they can contain multiple objects. The, the objects can be at very different scales, small or large. They could be rotated in all kinds of ways. The lighting on those objects can be very different, and they can be occluded. Maybe one object is hiding another. So just as an example, we have like, you know, mite. Well, the thing is down here in the corner, and it's, it's cut off. Um, motor scooter, you know, if, if you looked at this, you might say that it's something else. You might say that, well, maybe it's people, maybe it's nighttime, maybe it's cars, and so on. Or like this one, where the true uh, label is grill, you, you, know, you might think it was automobile or car or something, or headlights or windshield or something else. And then this one, the true label was cherry, whereas you know, I would almost say it seems more like you would label it as dog, and so on. So these are, these are um, challenging problems. This is just for one method. This is, uh, these, these are the, actually we should look at like these things. The length of those bars shows, this is like a, a PMF over those classes. So with a probability of let's say maybe 0.75, it thought this was a leopard. The probability of 0.2, it thought it was a jaguar. Probability of I don't know, maybe you know, 0.03 or something, cheetah, and so on. <clears throat> so that's out of the thousand different possible classes, each one is given a probability, as we know, at the output of the softmax. And this is just the top five of those probabilities and the classes they correspond to. Okay, so that's that's this competition that was running. And when you look at what was happening, so here we go from 2010 to 2015. <clears throat> um, you know, in 2010, we had these various methods. Uh, these were not deep learning methods. These are traditional computer vision methods, maybe support vector machine, things like that. And you can see there's a range of uh, you know, performances from like 20% to in the low 70s. And um, so over time, you can, you can see that things get a little bit better, but there's sort of a ceiling as to what is possible with those methods, it seems. What was special in 2012 is that is when the first deep network was entered into this competition, and it was a huge um, advance. You can see it sort of broke through that barrier, and there's a huge gap between it and the other methods. This was the uh, AlexNet by um, Hinton, University of Toronto. The top five error rate was 15.3%, as you can see. And second place was 25, so it's, it's quite, a, quite a gap. And then when you look forward in time, you can notice that the next year there were a few traditional methods, but then after that, there was no traditional methods. It all became deep learning. And moreover, you can see that deep learning just kept getting better and better, closer to 100%. So this is um, really, 2012 marks the, the beginning of this current era of, of artificial intelligence. This is when uh, 
we had these huge breakthroughs. There was another big breakthrough in speech around the same time in, in speech recognition. And the, these, these two things were, were the two pioneers. And then pretty quickly, people tried these methods on many other problems and many other disciplines. And there's basically been a revolution since then. <clears throat> so yeah, so that's, that's kind of um, the significance of this competition and, um, and the timing and everything. So <clears throat> let's take a quick look at AlexNet. I'm not going to get into too many details right now because we're going to study it in more detail later. But um, the goal at the time for AlexNet was to build a very deep network. And at the time, what they thought was very deep is not what we think is very deep now. But basically, this was uh, an eight-layer network by the way that we're measuring layers. So we have seen in the previous unit like a two-layer network. And so when I'm talking about layers, I'm talking about a combination of linear and nonlinear processing. So essentially, they have eight layers of that linear, nonlinear processing. Um, <clears throat> as we know, the final layer, the dimension at least, has to match the, the task. And, in this case, the task was to classify between 10, 000, or 1,000 classes. So the final output has to have 1,000 you know, things coming out of it. Um, if you use the soft max at the end, then there are soft probabilities. And to make this work, they had to use a whole bunch of tricks that were at the time new. One of them is this ReLU. <clears throat> uh, one is max pooling, which we'll talk about. Another is dropout. Um, so all those things were key ingredients to make this work. And this particular network had 60 million parameters, um, and it had 650,000 neurons, or you know, hidden, hidden nodes within that network. We, we also call those feature maps. <clears throat> so that was AlexNet, and I'll, I'll talk in more detail about how all the layers are constructed and how to read this particular diagram in, in a few more slides. OK, so um, any, any questions so far? OK, so now um, we're going to try to get a little intuition about how these work. And actually, I don't like this slide, so we're just going to, we're not going to cover the slide. Um, let's just skip right to this slide. This slide is, in some sense, a synopsis of what we learned in the last unit. And the way that this picture was generated is a nice tool called TensorBoard, which sort of automates that demo that we saw that we built ourselves in the last unit. So this task um, here, again, is binary classification, where there were some blue dots in the middle and some yellow dots surrounding them. And this is a two-layer network. So we have the input, we have a hidden layer, and we have the output. And <clears throat> you can see here. These little plots are just like the heat maps that we generated in the last unit. And they visualize what is happening in, in this layer. So essentially, you can see that there's a, a linear classifier parameterized by this line. And here, there's another linear classifier, another one, another one. And those, those four linear classifiers give us these um, yeah, so we, we can think of them as, as boundaries. Um, essentially, in another sense, they give us half spaces. Each one of them, you could say, has like um, maybe 0 and 1 for that particular one. And then this one has like a 0 and 1. And when you look at the combination of 4, there's a particular binary pattern in the middle. Maybe it's like 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, whatever it is. That particular intersection of those four half spaces is how we think about this, this thing here. So this is sort of, this is how they work, right? We, we talked about this last time. We got some intuition. Um, <clears throat> we, we talked about it in great detail. So um, the question now is, what if we have a much more complicated region? You know, What do we do then? Does the same strategy work? And the idea is basically, yes. All we have to do is add more of these 
neurons and more layers. So here we have a um, one, two, three, four layer network. <clears throat> and you can see that in the first layer, we have these half spaces because that's essentially, if I have you know, a linear stage followed by a sigmoid top type nonlinearity, what I have at that first stage is, is I, I can construct all these half spaces. Then what we do in the second stage is we look at intersections of those half spaces. And with those, we can make shapes like, like this, or like this, or this one is sort of this shape like this, and so on. Right? That's what we can do by putting these shapes together. <clears throat> then, if we add another layer, we can do even more sophisticated things by combining those shapes. And then we start to get you know, more interesting shapes. And then we can be, you know, by putting these together, we can do even more. And so you can see how when you add more layers, you can do more and more sophisticated things. And at the end of the day, in this case, we are able to pretty accurately come up with a classifier that can distinguish all these blue samples from all these yellow samples here. Okay. So it's really just more of the same uh, as before, more layers, more neurons, things just get more and more sophisticated. <clears throat> um, so that's essentially it. We're, we're building hierarchies of, of patterns from simple to more and more complex. Any questions on this one? Okay, yeah. What are the different um, colors on the, on the lines themselves doing? Uh, so, so you have like a blue line coming out of the box and an orange line going out of the box. Oh, these ones? Um, yeah. I can't remember exactly. I think it might be that if you put a cursor over here, it sort of tells you something about how... I'm, I'm not positive, actually. Yeah. Not important? Yeah, it's not, it's not super important. Not you can... I actually haven't really played around with this a lot. I'm, I'm just using this for an illustration. But yeah, you, you can play around with this. This is part of, it's originally in TensorFlow, but PyTorch has a version of it too, and you can play around with this and um, read the documentation and probably describes all that stuff. So yeah, not sure. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yeah. From the first stage to the second stage, mm -hmm. you said uh, the intersection of two different blocks will be the result of the second one, right? It's like the intersection of half spaces. Half space, yeah. Then uh, if you see, like how do you uh, take uh, intersection of individual ones or uh, the probability, like the combination of intersection of each block in the first stage? Um, because the first stage also contains eight, and the second also has the eight, so intersection yeah. should be more in the second one, right? Well, so 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 each one of these is is exactly like we saw here, except that instead of four lines, there's eight lines, and so with eight lines, you can get more sophisticated shapes, and so like this picture is just an example, and. And then these are these are other examples of what you can do with eight. And the processing is always the same. So when you go, you know, from these here, what you're doing is you're doing a linear combination of all of those hidden features, and then you're following that with one sigmoid. So at the end, you get sort of a Whatever, whatever shape it is, it's binary. It's either, you know, here blue or white and, and in, in shades in between. So, but yeah, and, and then to go from here to here, you're again doing the same thing. You're taking a linear combination of those hidden um, neurons and putting them, that linear combination, through another sigmoid. So what's happening, though, is just the shapes are getting more complicated as you go. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Yeah. 
it leads to the next question. Why there is no blue line from the third stage to the picture? It's only orange line. Oh yeah, like like I said, I'm not exactly sure what they're using the color of those lines. I I suspect that it might have to do with maybe putting a cursor here, and then and then kind of seeing like how the information flows to that point. But I'm not positive. <clears throat> okay. All right. So that's so then essentially, you know, the the question is, well, how how do we do these sophisticated classification problems where you want to say, like, can I classify images of cats versus images of dogs? And it's really, it's really just like this, except, you know, more, more layers and um, it's, I guess another difference here is that in this case we have um, the, the original inputs are just two numbers. Whereas here, these inputs have you know tens of thousands of numbers because the numbers of pixels in the image would be like the number of different things going in here. So in addition to this general concept of hierarchies, um, we do have you know more sophisticated inputs, uh, and because they're so much larger, we have to be clever in how we build some of the processing stages. We can't, as we'll see, we can't just do uh, standard linear processing. That would be too expensive. So we're going to have to learn uh, something cheaper called convolution. And that's, that's going to be one of the big ingredients that makes it possible to, to do this. <clears throat> okay. But basically, the idea is very similar. You have a lot more layers. And the sort of things that you can learn as you go down through your network become more and more sophisticated. Maybe at the beginning you can recognize very, very kind of crude shapes. And then in some intermediate layers you can recognize more sophisticated shapes. And each time you go you're sort of building on those previous shapes and you're putting them together to get more sophisticated shapes. And then you're putting those things together to get you know, more sophisticated shapes, in this case, faces. So really, you're just building up this complexity as you go through the layers. <clears throat> yeah. So that's, that's essentially some of the intuition. Um, some other intuition is that it turns out that, once again, this is sort of how our brain works. So when you look at... Um, <clears throat> We look at the human brain. Um, the optic nerve nerves are connected to this part of the brain called V1. And V1 does very simple kind of processing of, of your retinal signals. Essentially, they, they've, they've done this by putting probes into V1 and, um, and coming up with visual patterns that excite particular neurons. And they find that the patterns that excite those neurons um, are exactly these sort of very simple kind of patterns that you end up learning when you learn these deep neural networks. And so that's sort of, those patterns are, are what are exciting the neurons in the first visual processing stage. And then V2 is, you know, combining these neurons from V1, and so on and so on, and the, the sophistication gets more and more, and eventually you can, you know, recognize very sophisticated shapes. So the brain is doing something, again, that's quite similar um, to these deep networks and convolution, essentially, at least the, vi the visual part of the brain. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit of history. Um, the first deep network was from the mid-60s. The first convolutional deep network was from 1980. The first back propagation in deep networks were from, again, the 80s. Um, <clears throat> but in those early days, there were several challenges people faced. Uh, first of all, there weren't any of these big data sets collected. So, and as we know, when you don't have enough data and you're trying to build a sophisticated model that requires many parameters to be sophisticated, it overfits because you have many parameters, not enough data, 
So that's an issue. <clears throat> also, in those days, computational power was very much limited compared to today. And there's other specific problems that um, they didn't realize at the time, but there's this kind of classic problem called the vanishing gradient problem. And so <clears throat> I mentioned in the last unit that uh, things like sigmoids and tan H, they don't work, they work fine for a few stages, a few layers, but they don't work when you have many layers. And the reason why is when you think about how those, this is like, you know, the input, input versus output of a sigmoid. <clears throat> or actually, this, this would be a tan H because of how I shifted it. And you can see that, um, remember that when you do backpropagation, you have to look at the slope of the activation. That's, that's one of the things that you pass back, right? So if you happen to be, if your input happens to be close to the origin, then your slope is close to one, a little bit less than one. The slope of this is exactly one at the origin, but if you're a little bit ahead or you know, in front or behind the origin, the slope is a little bit less than one. The problem comes where as you get farther from the origin, the slope just gets smaller and smaller. And so what happens is every time you go through one of these and the sample is not close to the origin, you get a very small slope or you pass a very small gradient. And that smallness just multiplies, right? It, small times small times small times small. And once you get to, you know, even like 10 layers, you find that the gradients that propagate all the way to the early layers are just tiny and they're essentially unusable. So that was one of the main issues with why um, deep networks didn't really work that well in those days. And so this is where the, the ReLU comes to the rescue because the ReLU has gradient values that are exactly either zero or one. Right, the ReLU looks like this. And so for any positive sample, the slope is one, and so that gradient does not shrink at all. Now, of course, if it goes, if it's the sample's negative, then no information flows backward. Um, and that can be a little bit of an issue, and so there's actually some tweaks on this, where you make this a tiny, tiny little negative slope here, or sorry, positive slope, a little bit like this. We'll talk about that later, but, but even this, this ReLU alone sort of solves, for, most, for the most part, this vanishing gradient problem. So that was one of the, the key ideas to actually make this work. But then there's, there's other key ideas like convolutional layers, pooling layers, training tricks like batch norm, dropout, skip connections. We'll talk about all that um, in a little bit. <clears throat> okay. So what we're going to spend the rest of this lecture on is understanding um, two-dimensional convolution because this is sort of the, the workhorse linear stage that is used throughout these deep um, vision networks, the ones that deal specifically with images and videos. So um, essentially, the idea is that when you look at what happens in the early layers of the network, they are looking at these uh, small local patterns. They're looking to see throughout the image, do you have little bumps uh, that are maybe tilted in particular ways different kinds of shapes. And then the later, now, the later layers, they combine those, you know, to get more sophisticated and more sophisticated and so on. So when you do this, uh, w w what we're essentially doing is we're trying to find these patterns somewhere in the image. And that, that procedure is, is called either convolution or correlation, depending on how you think about it. And <clears throat> One of the key ideas that this, that this sort of processing is translation invariant, meaning these little patterns could show up anywhere in the image. So it's not like you are going to favor the center from the right edge or the left edge. You're just sort of looking to see where do these patterns occur. <clears throat> um, so it's a sort of processing operation that is essentially what I could call pattern matching, what I'll describe here. So let's say you're looking for a local pattern. And let's say 
the image happens to look like this. So you have an image that happens to have a bunch of these handwritten characters just in a line, or you know, in rows, rows and columns. And let's say you're looking for a four. So what you could do is you could make a little template of a, one four here, and then I could slide this template around the image. And what I do is when I move it to a particular location, I do a pointwise multiply between the pixels in the template and the pixels in the image, and I sum them up. So if I move that four, this four, over here so that it's pretty well aligned with this four, it's not a perfect alignment, and the, those two fours aren't perfectly the same, but if I get it just right, I will get a pretty big output when I do this pixel-wise multiplication and sum because you know the blacks will hit the blacks, the whites will hit the whites, and you'll get a big output. <clears throat> On the other hand, if I take my template and I move it somewhere like here where there's really no four there, I'm not gonna get a big value out and it's gonna be small. So the way that we can then search for these local patterns is essentially we, we make a template which is called a kernel. It's gonna be something like, um, we're, we're gonna call it W. <clears throat> so this would be um, row K1, and column K2 within that template. And then this X would be the underlying image. And if you want to know, if I shift, if I shift the template to row J1, column J2 within the image X, and I compute the output at, you know, sorry, at that location, this is just a scalar, that would be Z. Okay, so this equation is just describing this correlation process. <clears throat> so again, J1 and J2 are the indices of where the template is centered. The K1 and K2 are the sort of dummy variables that are indexing through the different locations in that, um, <clears throat> in that template. And you can see they're offset in X, in the XM is they're offset by J1 and J2. So is this making sense about how this equation is describing this, <laughs> this kind of operation? This is important, so I want to make sure everyone understands. Are there any specific questions about this? Everybody, is everybody good with this? OK, so it's basically, yeah, so I'm sort of centering the location <laughs> around J, and then I'm just indexing, you know, over a small range of Ks centered at those points J, and then I'm doing a pointwise multiplication, this times this, and summing up all those different multiplications to get one scalar output. <clears throat> so when, when this W matches the shifted X, you get a big output. When it doesn't match, you get a small output. And that's how we can look for the places within X where you see things that look like, in this case, a four. <clears throat> so this is sort of the, this is the main way we're gonna do it. Okay, so if you look at the digital signal processing literature, like textbooks, courses, and so on, they actually call this two-dimensional correlation. So this is exactly the equation from the previous page. <clears throat> and if you want to implement this in Python, you have the SciPy uh, package and the signal processing library within SciPy, and then you can use the correlate 2D function, and it does exactly this. And we'll see some examples. Now, <clears throat> what's a little bit confusing is that in in the, in the you know, machine learning literature, they talk all about convolution, convolutional neural nets, convolution. But that term doesn't quite match what you see in the signal processing literature. So in the signal processing literature, when you, so I want to emphasize the pluses here, those match exactly what we <coughs> saw here. Now, when you talk about <coughs> convolution in the signal processing literature, it's very similar, except you have these minuses. And the minuses have the effect, essentially, 
of flipping and reversing the W, flipping it horizontally and vertically. So if you, if you flip W horizontally and vertically, that is equivalent to changing you know, these signs, swapping the signs there. So when you talk about convolution, essentially it's the same thing as, as what we described here, except you flip this horizontally and vertically. So that's what convolution is. Unfortunately, um, you know, for some reason, the machine learning literature refers to, when they say convolution, they're really talking about what the signal processing people say is, is correlation. Okay. So, but just understand that this is really, what we're really doing is, is we're, you know, correlation by signal processing terms. And I'm just specifying this just in case you compare it to what you've seen in other courses or what you see in textbooks and so on. So, um, so convolution in neural net packages does not include flipping and reversal. So we, to, in, in, if we actually want to implement the same thing with SciPy, we have to use this correlate 2D. <clears throat> and we'll verify this. We'll verify that when we do this in PyTorch and when we do this in SciPy, we get exactly the same thing as long as we use correlate 2D. Okay. Everybody good with that? Okay, yeah. Um, is the reason that uh, we can equate that convolution sum to um, the, uh, the kernel being uh, flipped, is that because the um, convolution operation is symmetric? Or? Um, well, I mean, I would say the easiest thing is just to do a variable substitution. So just come up with a new variable, like if you, if you want to call it L, define L1 is minus K1. So then this becomes plus L1 plus L2. And then you have to change the signs here. So then L1 would go from 0 to 1 minus K1. So it kind of goes backwards. So you can see that, oh, and then you're going to get a minus L1 minus L2 here. So you can see basically how this is getting flipped just from that variable substitution. <clears throat> OK, so um, yeah, so that's, that's just more about terminology. So now we're going to, so when we talk about convolution and all the slides, as we go forward, we're really referring to this operation here. Okay, so let's, let's understand a little bit more about how this works. Um, so one of the things that we need to do is figure out how we will treat the boundary conditions, what happens when we try to do this operation close to the boundary. So let me explain what this is. So, um, so here in light blue, this would be the image. In dark blue, this is the kernel. This is the pattern we're moving around. So this pattern is three by three, and our image is just a little bit bigger. And essentially, there's, there's only um, the way we're doing things here, which is called valid mode. There's really only four possible shifts of the kernel. There's here. I could move it to the right. And when I move it to the right, OK, so, so in this original position, what I do is I do the pointwise multiply of those nine things, right? And I sum them together, and then I enter the value here. So this is the output it is shown up here. So that's what happens when the pattern or the kernel is centered here. If I move that in this direction, then I do those. I multiply those things, add them up, and I would get this output. Right? And then there's, I could also move it here. Or I could move it here. But with the way that I'm doing it here is I'm not really allowed to move this pattern outside of the image. And you might say, well, I don't want to assume, since I don't know what the pixel values of the image were out there, I don't want to make any assumptions about them. So to be totally safe, I'm just going to never move my, my kernel there. Okay, so the trouble with that, I mean, this, this is certainly something you can do. The trouble with it is that the image shrinks in size when you go from the input to the output of this convolution operation, the image shrinks. <clears throat> so that's, that's maybe not so convenient. Another kind of the opposite extreme, which is what you tend to see in um, what you would see in a signal processing course or a signal processing textbook, is you allow the kernel to move maximally so that it has at least one pixel of overlap 
with regard to the original image. So now you can see you could have the kernel here, or and that would give you this, or you could move it to the right, and that would give you this, and so on. You could move it all the way over here, that would give you this. And so now when you do this, you can see that <clears throat> actually the image, this is the original image, five by five, the new image, seven by seven, has grown. Okay, so you know whether also you're essentially you're processing these samples out here, which are assumed to be zeros in most cases. So that could have weird effects because you know maybe the the image itself was not zero near the boundary. So all of a sudden you're creating this like very sharp boundary between light and dark, and you know you just have to understand that that's what you're doing. We'll show some examples of this, but. Now there's this sort of happy medium where <clears throat> you allow exactly as much zero padding as you need to keep the image the same size from input to output. So in this case that we have a three by three filter, you essentially allow one pixel of zero padding. If you had a five by five filter, you would allow two, uh, two pixels of zero padding and so on. So that works for any kernel that is odd by odd dimension. And this is called same mode. And this is the one that is what I would say is the most common, the most common one that you see implemented um, in deep networks, in part because it just keeps the images the same size as they flow through the network and you don't have to worry about them shrinking a little bit or expanding a little bit depending on the, the kernel size. Okay. All right, so, um, okay, any questions on this? Zero padding? Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, for the padding, I yeah. think I may use my other uh, numbers. By, uh, <clears throat> yeah, there, there are other padding strategies um, that you could use. So, for example, one nice strategy, if you really needed to, to do this, is you could take this image and you could, you could flip it. So you basically, you, you basically flip it over this way. And now, now these pixels agree with those, and it's, it's smooth, right? And then you could, you could also flip a version here, and then you could flip a version here and here, and then you could even, you could, you could fill this all out in a way that everything is smooth. And this is actually a pretty common approach if you need to do this. But I would say it's not what's done in, in deep networks just because it has a bunch of added complexity associated with it that's just not worthwhile. Yeah. Oh no, definitely not. You know, like if this if this image uh, had those pixels, then then this output would just be that shape. Yeah, and the kernels don't have to be square either. Although in practice, the kernels typically are square. In, in deep networks. <clears throat> Images uh, with the sort of convolutional processing that we're gonna describe can actually be of any size. That's one of the nice things about it because convolution doesn't really care about the size. If the image is bigger, it just makes the output bigger. There are a few tricks we'll have to introduce to deal with that, um, but we'll talk about those later. Okay, good. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so this is just sort of a, a detailed example with some numbers. Um, here it's showing you these are the, the kernel values uh, in the small numbers, and then the image pixel values are here, and it just shows you when you do the pointwise multiply and add everything up, it gives you that number. Okay, so it's just detailed example. Um, <clears throat> so now let's, let's quickly look at implementing this stuff in Python and getting some intuitions about what that, how convolution behaves. So we're going to use um, <clears throat> SciPy signal and SK image are the main um, <coughs> packages. We'll use this camera cameraman image. It's sort of a uh, famous image that's used in a lot of image processing articles and textbooks. And so let's first um, look at what happens with these different boundary effects. So. We're gonna make a really boring kernel. The kernel is just all ones, 
but then we're going to divide by the kernel size. Okay, so like this is a this is going to be a nine by nine kernel, but we're going to divide by eighty one. So that means that if you sum up all the numbers in the kernel, they add it up to one. <clears throat> and so what that means is if I move the kernel over here and I do sort of a pointwise multiplication between that kernel and the image underneath, I'm going to essentially compute the average pixel brightness at that location. And that is what I'm going to report in the output image. <clears throat> so as a result, it basically blurs the image. Because it's saying like, you know, this value here was the av average pixel brightness there, and so on. So as we move this nine by nine kernel around, things change quite slowly. And so that's why you, you lose the sharp edges. You, it just blurs all the edges. Because like the average changes slowly as you move, move that around. <clears throat> so the main thing we're doing here is we're looking at the, um, the types of boundary conditions. So we have the full mode, same mode, and valid mode. So when you do full mode, as we said, <clears throat> it's essentially like saying that there's a bunch of zeros um, all around the original image. It's just zero padding with a bunch of zeros here. And the thing to realize is that the way that these images tend to be coded, and this is a grayscale image, um, zeros, the darkest color black would be zero valued. The brightest color white would be, let's say, one. <clears throat> Sometimes it's 255, depending on whether you're doing things in the integer domain or real number domain. Um, I'll just, we'll just say that it's one. Pure white is one, pure black is zero. And so when you do zero padding, that's kind of like saying you have pure black around the edge. And as a result, you can see that when you then do your convolution, you get this blackish boundary. And when you zoom in to the corner, you can see exactly what it looks like. So here are the, um, because we zero padded, there should be eight different bands of gradual, you know, gradually decreasing value, gradually more and more black. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you do the valid processing, you get none of that, right? Because you never let your kernel go outside of the original image. There was no zero padding. And when you do the same, it's sort of halfway in between these two cases. You do have a little bit of a boundary. Um, but you know, not as bad as, not as pronounced as that boundary. Also, when you look at the shapes, the original image was 256 by 256. So then with the full mode, it increased in size. With the valid mode, it decreased. And with the same mode, it stayed the same in size. Okay. And here, notice that we are doing this with correlate 2D because that is what signal processing calls this operation. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> All right. Any questions on this one? Yeah. Why does the uh, bottom boundary not add a similar effect? Like oh, it does. Yeah. So, so, so what you see, I'm just zooming in oh. to here. So if I would have zoomed in down here, you would have seen, you would have seen a similar picture, but the edge would have been down here. Yeah, no, no, it's just, this is just, this is like the top, I don't know, like 18 or so pixels here. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, so what about the kernel size? So let's do an experiment where we start with a 9 by 9. So that gives us the picture from the previous page. This is the same mode. What if we increase our kernel to 15 by 15? So essentially what happens now, <clears throat> the main thing that happens is when we do that local average, now we're taking a, an average of a bigger window, and so there's even more smoothing. So it's even blurrier. So as this kernel, these are uniform kernels, as they get bigger, everything just gets blurrier. And the, um, also the edge, the edge also gets more blurred too. Okay. All right, so any questions there? Okay. So what about kernel type. So let's use a slightly more interesting kernel. <coughs> this is called a Gaussian blur kernel. So it's, it's sort of like if you had a Gaussian or normal distribution, like a bell curve. It has that shape in both the horizontal and vertical directions. <coughs> um, so when you create this, you have two choices to make. One is 
you know, how many pixels to use. Another is the standard deviation used in that Gaussian. So if you increase the standard deviation, you'd find that this whitish region is bigger. And as you decrease the standard deviation, you'd see that it's sharper. There'd be a, a few white pixels in the center and then it would go quickly black. Okay, so we use, I can't remember what was used here, but um, the effect of this is if you compare it to the uniform of the same size, it's a little bit less blurry, right? Because it's doing a weighted average where it's mainly weighting these pixels, whereas the uniform would be w just weighting all of those. So that's kind of the, just qualitatively, it's, it's a bit less blurry. Um, but people, people tend to use these more in practice because um, I guess usually when, when you do this, you, you kind of want to, I guess you sort of care more about the pixels closer to the center. Um, and so this is just sort of a soft way of, of doing that. So this one is, is more popular than the, uh, the uniform kernel. <clears throat> okay. Oh, by the way, the, the main reason that these are used at all is to do denoising. So if there was a lot of um, random noise where you had, let's say, zero mean noise that was just randomly independent across pixels. If you do this averaging and the noise is zero mean, it, the noise tends to be reduced quite a bit, right? Because you're just looking at the average of these zero mean quantities and the average is close to zero. So that's, that's the main place you see these sorts of things being used. The downside is, you know, the, the wider your kernel, the more your noise reduces, but the blurrier the image becomes. So there's a trade-off there. Um, and this is a very crude way of doing denoising. There's much more sophisticated ways that give you noise reduction without blurriness. But just from a simple perspective, this, this would be a simple way of doing it. <clears throat> okay. All right. So um, there's more interesting things we can do, such as edge detection. <clears throat> and so for this, we just have to create filters that are a little bit different. So these ones are called Sobel filters. These are, these are also kernels, just you know, three by three kernels in this case. And <clears throat> let's, let's take a look at the left one. So here you see positive, zero, negative. So if you, if you put this on top of an image that has brightness over here and darkness over here, because the brightness has large pixel values relative to darkness, you'll get these large, you know, positive numbers times large values minus your negative numbers times small values, and you get an overall something that's positive. Right? So when there's light over here and dark over here. On the other hand, if there was dark over here and light over here in the underlying image, you'd get a negative value. And if the image was all the same brightness around here, because these and these cancel, you'd get zero. So that's the sort of, that's how it works. So you get a zero output when this is in a region where the image is constant. Positive when the image is going horizontally from light to dark. In other words, a vertical edge horizontally from light to dark or negative if you're going from dark to light. Now this one works the opposite way. If you have you know, light on top, dark on the bottom, you'll get positive. So light to dark, or that would be a horizontal edge, light, dark. And negative would be another horizontal edge from dark to light. We'll see some examples. Um, the last thing to discuss is, you know, you could get the same effect if you put, um, if we made them uniform in this direction. But this is sort of a little closer to Gaussian, which means it's going to focus a little bit more on what is happening, you know, in the center. Um, and so it, it causes a little bit less blurriness than if, if it was uniform. So that's, I think, part of the intuition is why these, these are Gaussian sort of shapes in that, in that direction.
Okay, so let's take a look at how this works. So here we just build, um, manually we build our kernels, put them into Correlate 2D, we'll use valid mode convolution to keep the images the same size. And so here you can see um, this is looking at vertical edges. So maybe we'll take, um, take this edge here. So we're going from light to dark. And so you can see that right there, there's a white, right? Right, right where that is, it's white, positive. So here, the way this is plotted, gray is zero, white is positive, and negative would be black. So then when you look at this edge, which is mostly a vertical edge, you can see it's black. Similarly, if we look at, let's say, the edge right on the top of the guy's head, you can see for this vertical for this other kernel that is white and um, what about this edge here which is dark to light now well, it's not very clear but here's here's sort of a, a black one over here dark to light dark edge okay so these are a little bit more interesting it just shows you what you can do with the kernel shape, the kind of patterns you can detect. And of course, these are both very simple. You can imagine you can detect you know, more interesting things by using more interesting kernels. OK, all right, any questions on this? So we're almost done with what I wanted. Oh, actually, um, yes. So, so that, that's actually it for today. Later, I'll, sh I'll demonstrate with PyTorch convolutional layers that will get exactly the same outputs. But that's all I wanted to talk about for today. Um, and then just to, uh, wanted to let you guys know next week, I'm not going to be able to lecture in person at all. Um, I'm going to be out of town for the beginning of the week. And then I have uh, another situation at the end of the week that prevents me from being here and from being even online at the same time. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to upload videos onto YouTube. I'm probably going to use the videos that I recorded last semester. Um, the notes are going to be identical. So, um, so that's what's going to happen this next week. So you don't need to come to lecture at all. Um, and then just keep in mind, as I mentioned, I think last time you have a midterm um, in a little bit less than two weeks, right? Wednesday, not next week, but the week after. All right. Any, any questions? Um, I, I'll, unfortunately, I'll also well, actually, I could do I can do um, office hours next Thursday, so I'll be here in person for office hours, but just not for any of the lectures next week. All right. Okay. See you guys um, next week, Thursday or the week after.